it is really wonderful to be here. It's such a joy to have Sharon uh, with us this evening. I've been a fan of hers for quite some time. And, you know, there, it's always amazing, isn't it, how there's certain people who, when you're with them, they have this wonderful energy that always makes you feel light and happy and, uh, and really connected, and she's really one of those people. Um, so some of you may not know her story, and I'll share a little bit of it, and then we'll perhaps get into a little bit more detail, but uh, her parents, uh, I think, separated when she was four, and her mother passed away. And then uh, she was taken care of by her father's parents who um, he had abandoned them, but she was put in their care. And uh, obviously those types of situations uh, are difficult. And it's always interesting because some of the wisest people and really evolved people that I've met are often people who have suffered deeply. And the reason that they connect so well with people is because they can see the suffering in other people and appreciate the pain and be with it. And, um, and it also allows you to grow because when you're in pain and you suffer, you can wa learn wonderful lessons about people, about life, and hopefully about your place in the world. Sometimes that's not the case either, it can really suck. But I'm giving you the upside of these uh, things. Um, but in, uh, and I always have to remember this stuff, so I have to go back into my mind here. So I think in 1969, uh, she was taking a Asian philosophy or study course at uh, SUNY in Buffalo. Uh, <clears throat> and then in 1970, she actually studied abroad in India and uh, ended up at Bodh Gaya and then uh, had the opportunity to study meditation uh, with several uh, well-known teachers. And then she came back and began teaching um, Vipassana meditation. And ultimately this led to her uh, developing a relationship with Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield, and this is the origin of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, which has expanded to include the Barrie Center for Buddhist Studies, as well as the Refuge, and uh, is really one of the most active, well-respected uh, Buddhist centers in the West. In addition to the thousands of students she has taught the practices which she learned. She's also a well-known speaker and author, having a New York Times bestseller, and we were just discussing actually writing books and the process of that. And uh, she has also uh, come to represent what's possible through a life of dedication to practice and living with compassionate intention. So without further ado, thank you all again for coming and we'll be begin our conversation on compassion. I forgot to say, my name is Jim Doty. I'm the director of Seek Care. We are hosting this event and uh, our uh, intention is to create a center that studies the neuroscience of compassion and altruism and develop te techniques and tools which allow individuals to maximize their own capacity for those behaviors and by doing so, reap the positive benefits in regard to health, wellness, and longevity. So thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I had to memorize that all. I can't believe you did it, you read a whole thing, like a thousand pages or 10,000 pages, and you remembered that. <laughs> wow. See, this is the power of meditation. Well, again, thank you so much for coming. You know, uh, I alluded to some of uh, your own background, and I hope you didn't mind. Uh, but maybe you can tell us 
a little bit more about that, at least in the context mm -hmm. of how it drove you and perhaps how it made you have a desire to see the world with perhaps more clarity and mm -hmm. purpose? Well, I, uh, no, I didn't mind at all. <laughs> uh, I've written about it as you know, we, we sort of talked about and spoken about it. Um, certainly it drove me. Uh, and I went to college when I was 16. I went to Indy when I was 18, and there's obviously a reason for that. Uh, it was when I was sitting in that Asian philosophy course, which honestly, looking back, I, it was almost happenstance that I took it. There was a philosophy requirement, so I needed a philosophy course. I looked at the schedule, and I thought, it's on Tuesday. You know, that's convenient, <laughs> something like that. So I did the course, and it completely changed my life uh, in a couple of different ways, certainly. One was the Buddha's, what seemed to me the Buddha's very unafraid, unashamed acknowledgement of the suffering in life. Because like many people, I, I mean, I clearly had a lot of disruption and trauma in my life. And, and like many people, mine was a family system where this was never, ever spoken about. And so I didn't know what to do with all of those feelings inside of me. And here was the Buddha saying right out loud what I knew damn well was true, you know? that suffering is a part of life. It's not just you. You don't have to feel isolated or aberrant or that life has somehow rejected you. Um, it's a part of life. And then I heard in that class that there's something you can do about that suffering, not to make it go away, but um, the way we hold things, even the way we hold pleasure. You know, Do we discount it because we don't feel we deserve it? Or are we so distracted we don't recognize it? Or certainly the way we hold pain, you know, with blame and shame and rejection, which only makes it worse. And I heard that there were tools, there were actual practices you could do that would change your life, that change your relationship to everything. So I looked around Buffalo and didn't see it. Um, <laughs> And there was, a, there was a program in, in the university, an independent study program, where if you created a project they liked, you could go anywhere in the world, for, theoretically, for a year. Uh, my joke is usually being Buffalo, New York, many people went and not that many people came back in a year, and it's true. I myself stayed longer than a year, but I went back and finished school, then I went back to India. Um, I said, I want to go to India and study meditation. And they said, okay. So I went, and uh, I think about that moment so often. You know, I could have stayed on the sidelines, I could have um, written papers about it, I could have thought, well, it's for everyone, but not for me. But I just went, I went for it. And I think that's why I actually wrote a book called Faith, because that's how I was defining faith, is like going for it. Um, and I practiced, and, and uh, if I can just continue on, um, one of my main teachers was a woman named Deepama, who, which is a nickname, like for Deepa's mother, uh, Deepama, who'd had tremendous amount of suffering in her life. Um, uh, she was in an arranged marriage, although she and her husband fell deeply in love. Um, she had three children, two of them died, and then, she was, she and her husband were living in Burma because he was in the civil service and one day her husband didn't feel well and he died by that afternoon, uh, by that evening. And uh, she was so grief stricken, she just developed a heart condition, she went to bed, she couldn't get out of bed. And the doctor came and it being Burma, he said, you're actually going to die of a broken heart unless you do something about your mind. You should learn how to meditate. So she got out of bed. She still had a daughter to raise. She got out of bed. And she went to the meditation center where the, the temple room, the, the hall, was on the second floor. And they said she was so weak, she couldn't walk up the stairs. She had to crawl to get up into the hall. And she meditated. And when she emerged, it was like with this enormous compassion. And it was a very powerful compassion and very kind of me, um, you know, uh, just so inclusive and caring about everybody. No one left out. Uh, 
she knew, you know, life could just change on a dime for anybody. And, and she was so loving and, and she was a very important teacher for me. So in 1974, I'd, I'd come back, I finished school, I went back to India. 1974, I was coming back to the States again for what I was convinced was a very short visit before I went and spent the entire rest of my life in India. And uh, I went to Calcutta to visit her, to get her blessing and say goodbye. And she said, my friend Joseph Goldstein had already come back maybe six months before. And Deepama said to me, when you go back to the States, you'll be teaching with Joseph. And I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. And I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. And I said, no, I won't. I'm just going back to like get a visa, you know, and come, ba come right back forever. And she said two things that were really important. She said, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach which was a tremendous thing because, you know, I had never really thought of everything I had gone through as being of any use to anybody. Um, and then she said to me, you can do anything you want to do. It's your thinking you can't do it that's going to stop you. And I left her little room and I thought, no, I won't. <laughs> and I came back to the States and uh, jo this was the summer that Naropa Institute was first beginning and Joseph was there um, teaching and our joke, although it's true, is that of this community of people who'd met in India, he was the only one with a job and an apartment, so we all went to Boulder. <laughs> and at one point, nine of us were living in his one bedroom apartment. <laughs> and if you know Joseph, he's extremely meticulous. This was not easy for him. And he tells the story from his side. He said he really struggled until the moment he gave up the thought that it was his apartment, <laughs> then he was okay. No, so I moved, uh, I and my friends moved into Joseph's apartment, and he was asked to stay on to teach the second semester at Naropa, so I stayed on with him. And then we were asked to teach a retreat, and so we taught that retreat, and we'd met Jack in Boulder, and so it was the three of us in different combinations who were uh, really, initiating kind of um, insight meditation here. And then uh, we started the retreat center and one day I woke up and I thought, I'm not going back. I mean, I've been back of course, but my life is here now. She was actually right. Uh, but it was, it was such a huge blessing to consider that pain and that difficulty as of value in some way. So when did you meet Jack? We met Jack in Boulder. Um, Joseph was there uh, uh, the first summer session, the summer it opened, and he was there as Ramdas's TA. Uh, <laughs> Ramdas was teaching an enormous mega class of like a thousand people, and he had these little subsections, like the chanting subsection, and Joseph was teaching the meditation subsection, and uh, Jack was teaching a course on his own. So um, they had already known each other for about six weeks by the time I showed up. And Jack was there for another two weeks before he left, so. Wow. Yeah. Well, other, another person, of course, who was there was Trungpa Rinpoche. Maybe you could tell us uh, some of those experiences. Sure, well, Trungpa Rinpoche uh, was his vision. It was his uh, place. And uh, he also had, I don't know how many of it was the same thousand people, but he also had a <laughs> mega class. And uh, they would have alternating nights. Occasionally they would, they would be in dialogue, but uh, it was very interesting because Ram Dass was um, a great proponent of, um, I, I mean, I think the way he would put it in terms of compassion would be see the divine in everyone, see everyone as divine. And Trungpa Rinpoche was like extremely grounded you know, it'd be more like, see the suffering in everyone <laughs> and, and unite. And they would, you know, kind of go back and forth and make fun of each other. And it was a lot of fun. That must have been a wild time. <laughs> so um, when you first started the center um, in Barrie, uh, were there a lot of people 
<laughs> <laughs> or was it just you? <laughs> just Joseph and Jack and I <laughs> just <laughs> walking around. For years. Uh, oh. There were not a lot of people. Um, I was 23 when we started the center, and they, Joseph and Jack were not that much older. We, we were very blessed in that we had a board of directors that actually knew what a mortgage was, you know, and would say things like, um, what if a roof leaks? You have to plan on that. You have to budget and go, really? Uh, you know, we were very nice. Well, actually, we couldn't get a mortgage um, from a bank, so uh, three people personally co-signed that loan. Wow. You know, so that we were really uh, indebted to them, and it was a wild and crazy thing to do. Our mantra the whole first year was, you can always close in a year. You can always just close it in a year. Of course, those three people who signed the mortgage were not that <laughs> happy to hear that. But, um, and... Uh, they were the days when, you know, you'd be at a party or some social situation and somebody would say to me, what do you do? And I'd say, I teach meditation. And they would kind of go, eh. <laughs> like, that's weird. Or occasionally somebody would say to me, did you meet the Beatles over there? <laughs> and I'd say, no, sadly, they went when I was in high school. I never got to meet them. And, um, and I think largely because of the science and the research and the clear sort of relanguaging of these tools, um, which I think is actually their original, it reflects their original purpose and meaning um, to be not so embedded in a belief system and so on. Um, it's so different now, but I think if we had 30 people in a retreat, we'd be really happy. Wow. When um, you were just sort of uh, commenting, things are different now. I mean, they're certainly very, very different. Uh, what is the danger, though? Some people call it uh, Mick meditation. You know, they call it McMansions. Now there's Mick meditation and some of these other terms about sort of the bursting forth of. Uh, meditation and mindfulness and uh, do you see a downside to this? Well, uh, yeah, people call it Nick mindfulness and Mick things like that, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, of course there's a downside, uh, but first of all, I think it's wonderful by and large. It's an amazing thing and it's also, going to happen whatever I think about it, you know, so uh, I don't invest in, you know, thinking I should be in control um, of how things unfold, but and some of it is a mystery. Um, this seems like the most naive conversation in the world, but years and years ago, somebody came to me and Joseph and said, um, I want to video you doing, a talk, doing talks and instruction and package it in such a way so that it, it could be like in a health food store. So if someone's going in to get vitamins, they could say, oh, there's a way to learn meditation. I could just pick that up. And it never happened anyway, but I, what's so amusing is to look back at Joseph and I like really considered it. Like, is that okay? You know, I had to go all the way to India. Like I'd never even been to California when I went to India. I was 18 years old, I had to get it together. And so by the time I got to India and I was first learning a method, I'd given up a lot, I'd risked a lot, I had moved, I'd matured in certain ways just in the seeking. So what's it gonna be like if someone just picks up a video that they weren't even wanting, they wanted vitamins. And you know, <laughs> maybe people aren't gonna take it seriously or it's not gonna have the same effect. And, like I said, it never happened anyway, but now it's so amusing to look back at that conversation. It's like, what about an app, you know? Like, uh, because it's, it's everywhere, and the accessibility, I think, is breathtaking. It's fabulous, um, and hopefully will grow so that all kinds of communities will feel connected to the possibility, and at the same time, I don't know what difference it makes that you don't have to have such a strong motivation 
strong intention. Clearly you don't, and so something else is gonna come up to make that work in some way. Um, there's also, you know, it's, it, there's always a danger of, of uh, having limited aspiration, I think, uh, because I think the path is vast and our potential is vast. And, um, you know, we were chatting a little bit, you and I, about compassion and how uh, some of these tools can be approached um, really just for like a little bit more focus or something like that. And that whole realm of compassion can be left out. And so what does that mean? What does that imply? Well, that, and I, I guess the question is, uh, what is it that you're trying to get out of it? Mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, I think most of us would like to believe we're getting some insight and wisdom versus simply a better way to trade stocks. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we were talking about uh, teachers, and um, I think, though, that's another issue is uh, because oftentimes, and if you look at Tibet wisdom traditions or Buddhism, there's typically a guru and the purpose of the guru is to get to know you and based on that knowledge, if you will, create a path of training that allows you to, uh, I don't know, maximize your potential or get the most out of, of training where some of the things we're talking about are just sort of more generic and does that really limit you or can mm -hmm. somebody, do you think, really get the most out of it or do they really need to attach to someone? Well, I, I think we live in interesting times, too. It's not that easy. Um, Gurus are not scalable, I guess. That's the they may not be scalable. And uh, it, I, I'm a very firm believer in the power of one's practice. Done with a sincere motivation, I think our, our own practice will take us a tremendous um, degree of where we want to go. And yet, having had teachers, and uh, very strong teachers, um, I know it's, it's an incredible blessing when it, when it can happen. And I think some of it is just in terms of um, the timing of when we realize something. I just think it's quicker with a teacher sometimes. So for example, um, we invited this Burmese meditation teacher, Saida Upandita, to come to Barry to the Insight Meditation Society in 1984 to teach a three-month retreat, never having met him before, but we heard he was a really great teacher, so we invited him, and I sat the retreat, Joseph and Jack sat the retreat, and uh, we were seeing Upandita every day, uh, or six days a week, for these very short meetings, which for some reason are called interviews, we just describe your practice and then you get some feedback. So he also, he turned out to be extremely tough. Like really just a fierce, fierce, demanding, intense teacher. And he also had a habit, since we were seeing him six days a week, where he would tend to say the same thing over and over and over and over again until something shifted inside of you. Then he'd go on to something else. So. I've been practicing very ardently for about 14 years, almost 14 years by the time he came. And we went through a whole run of, of time where I would go in and I'd describe something and he would say to me, well, in the beginning it can be like that. And I'd think, I'm not a beginner. I've been practicing for 14 years, but that would be it. That's all he'd say and I'd leave. And I'd come in the next day, maybe I'd describe something totally different. <laughs> And he would say, well, in the beginning, it can be like that. <laughs> and I think, I'm not a beginner. And I'd leave, like day after day after day, all he would say was, in the beginning, it can be like that. And at one point, I thought, why did we bring him all the way from Burma? He's supposed to be like a great <laughs> teacher. He never says anything. All he ever says is, in the beginning, it can be like that. And I was like, Maybe that was the only English words he knew. <laughs> it wasn't in English. It was through a translator. And it was day after day after day. And one day, it was like, I got it. And I thought, oh, right. It's good to be a beginner. That's not an insult. 
In fact, I had lost a lot of that um, power of presence. You know, I've been practicing for 14 years. I kind of knew what to expect and what should happen. And, and I was more um, half-hearted than was suitable. And he picked it up right away. And he really pointed to me, like, you've got to get here. You know, be like a beginner. Have that kind of openness and intensity. And, um, and he, I realized he's right. And the day I got it was the day he stopped saying it. And he went on to something else. <laughs> so would I have seen that myself in my practice? I think I would have. But he was just like right there. There it is. Look at that. Interesting. It's funny you say that. I, I um, for an intellectual exercise, went through five years of Freudian analysis. And it was a very traditional guy. And it, it was so bizarre because it's like what you read, it was like this guy, he'd always wear the same black suit, a white shirt, and this thin white tie. And he would just sit behind me out of my field of view where I could <laughs> just sort of see it. And all he would do is every day I would go in and he'd go, at the, he'd, you could tell your time is almost up because he'd cough. <laughs> okay? And then he'd say, that's interesting, you should think about that. And it was like every day. And I did the same go, why the hell am I paying you? Because I could just have a, you know, a blow-up doll sit there. And do that to me. But in his case, I could have. But uh, uh, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> I can ask you a question. Uh oh. Go ahead. Um, well, I find two things really kind of startling about talking about compassion in a society. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have the same kind of experience. One is um, the idea that compassion is not weakness because it's so associated often with uh, either being a doormat or passive in some way. And the other is that it's trainable, which people find very startling and maybe a little cold too, like I'm gonna go away for a weekend and I'm gonna come back compassionate <laughs> or something like that. And and both those things are so uh, embedded in the teachings that um, I just find that response again and again. So I'm wondering how you find it. No, I think you're exactly right. I, I think uh, in Western society, when the term compassion used for many, it's sort of this mamby pamby. If somebody's compassionate, that means they're really wimpy. And I, I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, when you're truly compassionate, that means you're vulnerable, and uh, that means you have to be open and actually be present to allow others to see your own degree of suffering and to be okay with that. And as some of you, there's my son and my wife right there. Uh, <laughs> my son doesn't think I'm as compassionate as I should be sometimes, so <laughs> I apologize if I'm uh, but uh, um, I think, and some of you who've heard me talk, you know, there's certain experiences that even today bring me back to a place that's very, very painful and hurts. But it's okay for me to be in front of a group of people and show that because it doesn't diminish me in any way. And in fact, people who allow that to be there and for because people think if somebody sees you vulnerable and suffering that they'll take advantage of you and it's never ever been my experience in fact if you do it you have all these women who come up and hug you which is <laughs> and some men too but it's all it's all okay because people naturally want to care for you and connect you because that is the default state for people. And so I don't think it's a weakness at all in any way. If you are truly compassionate, if you are truly present for someone when they're suffering, you're one of the strongest people in the world because it, to truly open your heart, to truly be there, to truly embrace someone, it takes an immense, immense uh, amount of, of uh, strength uh, to do that. So I don't think uh, that's the case at all. 
getting, of course, that's self-serving. Uh, but uh, uh, getting to your other point, which is training people, all of us have great potential. We do not appreciate the strength that each one of us has. And you can train yourself to reach, if you will, your, your maximum potential for being kind and compassionate. But why would you do that? And the reason I think that you would do that is because on every level, it makes your life better. It makes your life better in terms of every interaction you have with people. Every one of those interactions makes their lives better. It makes every person around you a happier person. And when you're in that state, when you're acting compassionate with intention, you have this incredible gratitude, you have this equanimity of spirit, and you appreciate the sanctity and the divine, if you will, in every person. So thank you for asking. Thank you. No, thank you. It's beautiful. Can I ask you another question? Okay. Now I see what you're up to. No, it's very interesting. Go ahead. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to have the correct scientific terms for that, but um, one of the uh, arenas that I work in a lot is caregiving. You know, people who are caregivers, either personal caregivers in terms of taking care of maybe an elderly parent or, or whatever, uh, or just being a parent, <laughs> you know, is, is a caregiving role, or professional caregivers, hospice nurses, or... Um, I did a four-year program uh, for frontline domestic violence shelter workers, and uh, that particular program is kind of morphed to international humanitarian aid workers. And so there are a lot of people who are on the front lines of suffering and have tremendous compassion but are burning out. So uh, it's, it's more... Uh, maybe it's the distinction between empathy and compassion that's in play there, or maybe learning how to have a better balance of compassion for yourself as well as for someone else. Um, so it's sort of like with all the emphasis that's happening these days on cultivating empathy, um, I think about uh, another ingredient that maybe needs to be there um, for these people who have tremendous empathy. Well, I think what happens for a lot of people who go, as an example, into the caring professions, nurses, doctors, mm -hmm. people who are uh, aid workers, one of the drivers is oftentimes their own suffering, and they feel this incredible need to do something uh, for other people. One of the reasons sometimes people do that is so they actually don't have to deal with their own suffering, right? Because if you're so involved in caring for somebody else, you don't have to sit with your own pain and face that and come to grips and become comfortable with that and understand it and be okay with it. So I think that's one of the, the real big problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other problems or problem is that that translates in the requirement that you have to have self-compassion. And you can't give it all the way, all the way because then you have nothing for yourself mm -hmm. and you, you fall apart. So I think that's really critically important and you have to make people understand who are doing that, that it's okay to be nice to yourself. For some reason, people carry this burden that they're not good they don't deserve to be cared for, they don't deserve to be loved, and of course, that's the person who you should be giving immense love to, because if you can't give that to yourself, it makes it really hard to authentically give it to others, 
and really reach your own potential of being a human being. So I think there has to be that component, and Kristen Neff, of course, has done a lot of work in that. She's spoken with us and uh, been uh, with us. And then the other challenge for some of us is boundaries. Does anybody have a problem with boundaries <laughs> in this room? Uh, and that's another thing that takes immense amounts of work is to be able to place boundaries around what you think is important and not always put your own self needs elsewhere while you're doing all this stuff for other people because then you do of course burn out. So I think those are our critical mm -hmm. aspects. Now I will have to tell you it's always interesting because people look to perhaps Sharon or myself or others as we talk about these things and they somehow think that we have this all figured out and it all works perfect for us and like my wife wherever she's sitting she will remind me by saying oh you think you're Mr. Compassion well you're really another word perhaps <laughs> that's not quite the same uh, <laughs> and that's the nature we're not perfect, we're going to fail, we're not gonna live up to high, our highest expectations, and that's just reality, and there's no reason to beat yourself to a pulp and be bloody because you're a human being. That's just, uh, well, I guess we're going on to questions. Go ahead. So, the way, s and Good. remember, when you do scientific endeavor, of course, you have to have definitions that are extraordinarily important, right? So generally speaking, uh, and I'll see if you agree with this, uh, is compassion is the recognition of another suffering with a desire to alleviate that suffering. It doesn't necessarily mean you are capable or in fact are able to, it's you have an intention or a desire or an aspiration to do so. Empathy does not necessarily necessarily have any relationship to suffering. That's how people think of it most often when you say, oh, geez, I have so much empathy. I can stand in your shoes and feel what you're feeling. But it's exactly that. You're feeling what someone is feeling, but that could be joy. I mean, you can have empathic joy, and that's uh, one of the four, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is it, four? Boundless states. Yes. yes. So I'm not a Buddhist, so I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Sharon? Well, I think from the Buddhist point of view, um, uh, compassion is sometimes described um, as the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. And it's a movement toward, so the trembling of the heart is, is a movement, right? It's a movement toward to see if you can be of help. So it's very similar. You don't know that you can be of help. And I'd also say it's a movement toward, not into, to burn up, right? It's a movement toward to see if you can be of help. So there's a kind of balance almost implied there. Because if you move into, you'll go down with the ship, basically. Um, it's a mixed metaphor. So I sometimes think of it as sequential, like, uh, assuming you, you're feeling empathy towards someone who's suffering. So it is that kind of situation. Um, you're resonating, you're uh, uh, vibrating, you know, mirroring, I guess, you know, um, that person. And, and it's also, I think, important to uh, say that you're not assuming, you know, it would be quite an imposition to say, I know exactly what you're feeling. Um, but there's a kind of knowing that likely, oh, you know, I was lied to once, it felt terrible. Likely you are feeling that kind of terrible feeling, or I was really upset once about this, or, you know, likely you're feeling that alone, something like that. But following that genuine moment of empathy might come a lot of different responses. Maybe we feel frightened by that. It's like the empathy was there, it's genuine, but, we're just freaked out, you know, we're so frightened, so we run away, or we're so tired. We feel so depleted, so overwhelmed, like I cannot bear to take this on, you know, or, or to relate to this. 
or we're blaming. You know, I gave you perfectly good advice six months ago. If you'd only listen, you wouldn't be in this sorry situation. Um, or we fall into that egotistical kind of thing, like, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix you. And How many people are in relationships like that? <laughs> <laughs> you've got a week to get it together. Here's your list of everything you need to do, according to my timetable. Or we can have the compassionate response, which is a particular response to that genuine moment of empathy. So I would say empathy, using the, way, the words the way I am, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for compassion to arise. A lot of things can arise in response to that empathy, even when it's genuine. And we need it. You know, We can't go on without it. But it isn't necessarily always going to lead to compassion. So there's wisdom that needs to be in there. I'm not in control of the universe, sad to say. I'll do everything I can, and I cannot fix it. Um, there needs to be balance. You know, I can't just forsake myself completely and go on indefinitely. It's just not realistic. Um, when you were speaking, I thought of one of the women who did the program for domestic violence shelter workers, because we started with frontline workers, and then um, we went to supervisors and directors of shelters. And by the time we got to uh, the directors of shelters, uh, they coined a term, which I loved, which was in terms of what they wanted to see at the workplace, they wanted to see a culture of wellness. And for everyone, that meant something a little different. Um, but interestingly enough, for everyone, it also meant a place, some place where people could go and just chill. Um, but anyway, one woman said, I'm determined in that spirit I'm determined to start taking a lunch break. And everyone in the room who did not work in a shelter said, you don't take a lunch break? Isn't it in your contract? And she said, oh, yeah, but it's like there's too much. There's always a crisis. Somebody needs me. But she said, now I see. I've got to do it. So, Because we were meeting in between retreats. We got to hear her, her progress with her resolve. So the first time she came in, she said, didn't work. She said, I closed the door, but someone crouched down and looked through the keyhole. <laughs> and they saw that I was in there, so I didn't get a break. And maybe three weeks later, she came back and she said, it worked. I closed the door and turned off the lights. <laughs> and I got a break. You know, that has to be there, ultimately. So there are lots of ingredients to what makes compassion I think sustainable and strong. Does anybody else have a question? Do they need to use the microphone? Or is it okay? No, we'll repeat the question. Uh, how to promote self-compassion caregivers. Uh, one, I think, like the story I just told about that woman, I think the hardest step was feeling she deserved the lunch break. So some of it is just the creation of a supportive community and the reminders that this is okay. This is not weakness or um, you know, giving in or something like that. This is an important thing. And we used actual tools of yoga and meditation, uh, both mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. And we practiced together. And we encouraged people to practice. Um, and within both of those, mindfulness and, and loving kindness, there's a kind of balancing that happens where we, we develop a different relationship to what's going on. Um, so it came from within, as well as the community is, it, they're tools, you know, they're like skills. And so people actually picked up the skills and, and were practicing it. And we, when we were designing the program, we were very, um, interested that more than one person per shelter come so they could support one another. So we try to set the stage for that to, to be able to be ongoing. And with the um, international humanitarian aid workers, this is, these two programs are through the Garrison Institute, in Garrison, New York, uh, they're creating an app because people are everywhere. And um, 
that will be like a companion, you know, for for continuing on your practice if you if you want to do that. And just to comment on that, I think that it is really important that you create a work environment where it's okay to take a break, that there is a place where you can go, there is a situation where there are individuals you can go to and you don't have fear or anxiety or a sense that by, as an example, having a lunch that somehow you're letting people down. When I was first started in private practice as a neurosurgeon, I thought I had to be available for everyone all the time. And I would be on vacation and somebody would call and go, oh, I have to go. And I realized, frankly, I was just dealing with my own ego because I was the guy that they would call and I would show up and I would save the day because they needed me. And suddenly, the reality was that amazingly, if I wasn't there, the world went on. And uh, while I was good at what I did and still am hopefully and was available, people accept that you can't be everywhere all the time and it's okay to take care of yourself. And it's not like they dislike you suddenly if you care for yourself. And in fact, they, I've had many people come in and go, geez, I was wondering what was going on with you, why you didn't take vacations. I thought there was something wrong with you where you were hiding from something. And in fact, I was, right? <laughs> because the more I said I was caring for other people, I didn't have to deal with my own pain that was sitting there because I would always say that these other people are more important than resolving my own issues. Yes, sir. Did everybody hear that question? Uh, it was, if Buddhism is the practice of the middle way, what is the middle way of compassion? Is that a correct statement? Does anybody have that answer? <laughs> I'll try. Um, I think it's infusing compassion with wisdom, which is a good idea anyway. Um, in this sense, sometimes we describe it like this. Um, there are different aspects to an action. Uh, the f I'm looking for a prop, so I'll use this. This is not product placement. Um, <laughs> Please hold that Starbucks logo so they can see. The first and critically important element of an action is the motivation or the intention behind an action. This is a very Eastern concept. It's not so prevalent in the West where we're more fond of saying things like the road to hell is paved with good intentions or um, what do you mean you had a good intention? You completely screwed up. Uh, but say from the Buddhist psychological perspective, the motivation or intention behind an action is a critical component. So I can reach down and pick this up and hand it to one of you, but why? You know, what's the motivation? What's in my heart? Maybe I'm offering it to you because I like you and I want you to have it. Or maybe I see you have a thermos and I think, well, hey, you know, maybe I'll give you the iced tea and you'll give me that thermos. Or maybe I just gave a whole big lecture on generosity and I want everyone to think I'm a generous person. Or maybe I don't like you and I'll think, ha ha, didn't put any sweetener in it. <laughs> <laughs> Have some tea, you know, but it's like the same smile, it's the same gesture, but it's coming from a completely different place. So the energy of the motivation is a crucial measure of our integrity, right? Where are we coming from? And I say in, in the workplace, like one way to translate that is, what do I really want to see most happen out of this encounter or phone call or, or meeting? You know, do I want to be seen as right? Do I want to be helpful? Do I want to be harmful? Do I want to grind them into dust? Do I want a resolution? What, you know, and that will help us see a lot. So what's the motivation behind the action? And the second aspect of an action is the skillful execution of it. You know, maybe I reach down out of this beautiful motive to hand someone the tea, and maybe I stop and think, you know, 
a lot of people in this room. I only have one. Maybe this is best done privately or, you know, it's like we use discernment. We use uh, kind of mindfulness in a broader sense of a context. Um, where am I at? What's happening right now? What seems to me, I sometimes call it our best guess of the most useful thing to do in that particular situation. Okay, so the reason we talk about this a lot in terms of compassion is that practices like loving kindness or compassion meditation or practices that deepen that quality are said to have the most powerful effect in the field of motivation. Like why are we doing things? Why are we saying things? Or why are we refraining from saying or doing things? You know, maybe in general we've been coming from a place of fear and then we strengthen these qualities and we find we're coming from a place of connection, okay? That doesn't mean that there's only a narrow band of action that is skillful, like only saying yes, only being sweet, only being meek. And we confuse those two. We think the motivation and the skillfulness of the action are the same thing and that's the place from which so many people say, I don't know if I want to develop a more loving heart. I'll let people step all over me, or I'll give away all my money unwisely, or I'll let these other people be hurt or oppressed, and I won't say anything. But really, those are two different things. You can be coming from a deeply compassionate place, and your best guess of the most skillful way to act in a certain situation, in a certain context, is pretty fierce. It's like my teacher Upandita, he wasn't that sweet, you know, or whatever situation we're in. Maybe we're not going to give somebody money or we're going to say no or we're going to take really strong action to try to protect somebody else. And um, that, I don't know if that's the middle way of compassion, but I think that's the real manifestation of compassion is knowing that in our hearts we're completely inclusive and connected to the best of our ability and that it might look a thousand different ways. Just to add a little bit to that, I was having a conversation with the Dalai Lama about this topic, and uh, I said, well, what if there's this sort of evil guy, and the reason he's sort of, uh, by appearance, being nice to people is because he has another intention. As an example, he gets a tax write-off, or uh, you know, he's giving food away that's about to expire, and then he gives it away and takes a full write-off for the full value, when in fact, that day or the next, it has no value, right? And it was interesting because uh, His Holiness said, well, if the action benefits people and is good, who cares, as long as it's a good action? Then he looked at me and said, unless you're a Buddhist, because <laughs> then intention uh, does have great, great import because that leads to a karmic consequence mm -hmm. of, uh, of that intention. The other side of getting back to this point about compassion and it being soft, as an example, uh, in my position, either uh, being a boss uh, and running a company, which I've done in the past, or training neurosurgery residents, or being responsible for other people who work uh, under me in the context of supervision, they're people who don't perform and you give them appropriate opportunities to improve and they don't. And the compassionate thing is to make them aware of it, make them understand that they aren't performing and that perhaps or in fact, they have to find another job. That's being compassionate. Caring somebody who can't function or do their job is not being compassionate. In fact, it's actually in some ways quite mean because it's not allowing them to grow or to develop wisdom and have self-awareness of their own limitations. And so sometimes, that's actually the most compassionate thing you can be is to be absolutely brutally honest as your teacher was and we're basically, in fact, the Dalai Lama was telling me one day he had a teacher who had a stick and 
he would hit his knuckles all the time. And, uh, uh, but he had a purpose <laughs> in which he hit his knuckles, although I don't think the Dalai Lama, when he was 10 or 11 or 13, appreciated that intention, but uh, he was getting, his teacher was getting his attention, his focus, and making him understand. So uh, sometimes compassion, the process of it can actually be uh, perceived by some as being quite mean or actually not really being kind, when in fact it, it really is just uh, the opposite. The challenge us, for us though is to recognize that and to still do it versus falling back on thinking compassion is the opposite, I think. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to repeat the question? Uh, yes. So in this context, uh, she is working in Kenya for the past four years, bring together individuals with traditional African tribal practices to, with Muslims and with Christians. And since they're all part of a community, how do you create a framework in which they can respect each other and work together for the benefit of the entire community? Is that paraphrasing it correctly? <clears throat> the challenge in those situations, I think, is that of the problem is attachment, the way I see it. All of us want to hold on to something that makes us special and separates us from other, and it's a natural instinct because this is how we evolved as a species. We want to identify with people who are like us, either look like us, act like us, have the same values as us, and that therefore makes us special and gives us meaning and purpose. And frankly, when you're around people like that, it makes you feel comfortable because there's a sense of trust, there's a sense of acceptance, there's a sense that they think like you, and it's not foreign. Because foreign does what? It makes you uncomfortable, it makes you uncertain, and it makes you frightened. So I think one of the best things that one can do is to have a conversation where each group, not necessarily directly religion based, each group identifies what is important in their lives. And almost invariably, what does it come down to? It comes down to caring for their spouse, their children. It's creating a safe environment. It's making sure that there's food. It's making sure that there's safety and that there's a place uh, where people can go without a feeling of uh, threat. And when you let these people talk in this fashion with removing a direct conversation about the dogma, you suddenly are having a conversation that is the same for everyone. And then when you recognize this sameness, then it's hard to look at somebody as being not like you because there's so much actually that's like. And you know, David DeSteno talks about this where there's a tendency to identify in group and out groups. And it's a very natural tendency and so when you see somebody who is markedly different than you, it's easy to sit there and say, I don't want to get to know them, I want to be away from them. But then when you sit there and say, wow, you know, they have this certain tradition related to their children, or geez, there's a certain thing that they value, whether it's love of land or whatever, and then you suddenly say, well, I have the same thing. And then you, as you keep doing this exercise, you start getting closer and closer to seeing someone that's just like you. And once you have that connection where you go from objectification to humanification, that's when this connection occurs and you recognize the oneness of everyone and then you can embrace them. I would also say sometimes people can come together in silence, sometimes they can't but in a, a spiritual endeavor, uh, sometimes silence is actually the, um, the place where people uh, find their own deepest roots and 
and are sharing that, you know, apart from the dogma and apart from the belief systems. I also, uh, hearing you and, and hearing Jim, I was reminded of this time I was at a Buddhist Christian conference at Gethsemane Monastery with the Dalai Lama. Um, and um, the first day or so was kind of hard going. Uh, and it felt like the conversation was only happening on a certain level. And then Norman Fisher, who at the time was the abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center, he just got up and he spoke from the heart and it was really interesting. He said something like, I don't want to be offensive in any way. I really mean this question sincerely, but he said, I see all these crucifixes around and I don't find them that inspiring. Like, I find them really hard to look at and like, what is it about that that makes them so inspiring or, or moving? And it was really interesting because then the real conversation happened about suffering. What about suffering that's nowhere to go? What about feeling your suffering is shared or not shared? What about, and it was like a completely different gathering from from that point on, and I was just like so grateful <laughs> that, uh, you know, because it's also a hard thing to say, and basically in someone's home. Um, but it was so sincere that I think it was not offensive, and it brought us to what we do share, which is that grappling with the suffering in life. How many people came to the conversation I had with Glenn Beck? You know, uh, that was an interesting conversation. That's startling. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly thought, wow, I feel I'm in a different lineage than I've ever <laughs> been in before. Well, and th the point is, though, that I did that very specifically because showing compassion isn't showing it for just people you like. And, and in the context of Glenn Beck, here is a fellow who has four million followers who pay about 10 or $12 a month to get his content. He has 50 million unique viewers every month on his website. And his website's the 75th most visited website in the world. Well, it's easy for me to sit there and say, well, the people who go to that website are idiots. They obviously don't know anything. They're just so naive and stupid. And it's not the case at all. Many of these people are very thoughtful people. It's just they're seeing the world a different way than I'm seeing the world. And for me to be dismissive of those people is really frankly arrogant and insensitive and wrong. So for me to reach out to him, to sit with him, and in some ways remove the bombastic dogma and to engage in a real conversation, we ended up having a wonderful conversation which was quite pleasant, and I actually liked the guy at the end of it. Now, are there some things that I still sit there and go, Glenn, why did you do that? Of course, but I understand him much better, and I can hold him, and I can care about him, and I don't necessarily have a bad feeling. It pains me some of the things that he may do, but I have insight into him, and I can accept him, and I don't think he's an evil or bad person, and hopefully, he doesn't think that I am either. The thing I have to tell you, though, which was fascinating about that, was that I had never gotten left-wing hate mail, which I did get, which was sort of strange, right? And in fact, it was fascinating because I got a, 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 an email from a woman who said, I cannot believe you would have this misogynist, bigot, horrible person at Sea Care. I have been going to your events for two or three years, and now I will never attend another event that you put on because I'm so disgusted with you. And by the way, I just bought these CDs in which you were on with Rick Hansen, and after this, I broke them. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's signed by, like, Mary, family therapist. <laughs> which is like... What? <laughs> I mean, here, this person who theoretically is counseling others and open and developing relationship just 
destroys me, right? But, uh, but yeah, so, so again, compassion isn't for those who agree with you. That's easy. Compassion, when it's evolved, it's there for everyone. And that's the hardest thing. And if, you, you know, it may take a lifetime, you know, to get to the point where you can just get beyond having compassion or an open heart or love for just strangers. It's, it's not easy and it takes time. But I think when you can get there, it suddenly makes you have a very light spirit because truly you are connecting with everyone, recognizing you are me. Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was, we see these horrible events going on in different parts of the world and here as well. And they're very troubling because in some ways their humanity at its worst, and that's our perception, and how do you deal compassionately in those situations? Well, it's not easy, you know. I mean, I would never want to be glib and, and pretend like it's easy, but I also think it's possible and it's probably important. Um, and some of it goes back to what I was saying before about the difference between motivation and skillful action or skillful execution of action. Because I think the more we think of love or loving kindness or compassion as, as oh, this is kind of like passive, wimpy, sentimental thing, the less we're going to see it as the force that it actually is. Um, and I think it is a force. It, it can be a tremendous motivation for action, even if the action's really fierce um, and intense. So some of it, I think, is that. Some of it is, I, you know, I think of people like Aung San Suu Kyi, who is, the, um, who is uh, in a way, that still the head of the democracy movement in Burma, who spent, I think it was like 17 years under house arrest and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991 while she was under house arrest. And um, during all those years, she would occasionally, uh, the, the restrictions on her would loosen up. And so she would have the chance to meet with journalists or, or do interviews. And then they kind of stick her back under house arrest. And one of those times of relative freedom, she was doing an interview, I think, with a Japanese newspaper. And she said, my colleagues and I think about and talk about loving kindness a lot. And now these colleagues were often people who were not just under house arrest, they were under arrest. And Burma's um, prison somehow has the name of insane prison, spelled differently, but I think it's apt. And you know they were being tortured, they were in, in prison. And, and she said, my colleagues and I often talk about loving kindness because we feel we have been uh, receiving the actions of those lacking in loving kindness. So we've been dehumanized, we've been depersonalized, we've been abused, um, we've been discounted. Because when you don't see someone as a person, you can do anything to them. Right, and so she said, we don't want to perpetuate that. So we need to find the strength, and it takes strength. You know, in all those years, um, she struggled. Her children were being raised by her husband in England. Uh, she never got to say goodbye to him after he was diagnosed with cancer because they wouldn't, the government wouldn't give him a visa to go back in, and she never left. Uh, it seemed from time to time there was the opportunity to leave, but in leaving she would clearly never be allowed back in, and she was really the hope for democracy of the Burmese people. So she was strong, and yet really made the effort to have it not that strength not come from a place of just endlessly seeking revenge and uh, you know the kind of meeting brutality with brutality and so on. So as hard as it is, and of course the Dalai Lama is a tremendous model of that, uh, we do have models, a few, of, of people who um, are like really strong and yet coming from a very different place. Yeah, I mean look at Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. Desmond Tutu. You know, the Dalai Lama tells a story about a, um, 
a monk who was tortured for something like 20 years and finally escaped. And in the conversation with the Dalai Lama, the monk broke down. And he broke down because at some point, he thought he might lose his compassion towards his tormentors. So that's really how powerful uh, that is. So, you know, having that degree of strength is extraordinary, but that is truly it in its highest manifestations. The other thing you have to realize when you see these horrible things like these beheadings and stuff, you have to perhaps try to understand what it is that's driving some of these people. You know, if you grew up in poverty, you have no education, you're being manipulated, perhaps, you don't have clarity of vision, you're doing actions which may not necessarily be your own, but are driven by uh, different types of others' motivation, and you, in fact, see uh, that underneath there, you might have more sympathy. In fact, it's interesting, and I don't want to make a comparison between the two, but I was talking to somebody and they were, they were complaining because they were driving along and someone cut right in front of them and almost made them have a car accident. And their natural tendency was to do what? What do you do when somebody does that to you? Either you say something or you use a hand movement or both and you hit your horn. But let's put it into a different context. What if his wife was pregnant and she, he was driving her to the hospital and she was bleeding? Now how do you see that action? It's completely different, isn't it? And by giving that benefit of the doubt and having that thinking through that, it stops you from sort of going off into making a judgment of which you may not, in fact, have all the facts. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, you, Sharon spoke of faith earlier when she was 18, and what is her faith now? Well, faith is a little bit of a tough word, you know. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, it doesn't mean like a commodity. It doesn't mean belief. Uh, it doesn't mean something that you either have or you don't have. And if you don't have the right kind or if you don't have enough, all is lost. It's really a process of the heart. Um, the word that's being translated is literal is literally means uh, offering your heart or placing your heart. So that's why I just said, you know, when I was 18, it's like I moved from feeling so marginalized, which was probably the strongest feeling I had in my life, as though I were like on the outside looking in. I, I moved to seize an opportunity. I moved right to the center of change and possibility, you know, instead of standing back. And, Standing back was the most natural thing in the world for me, you know, because I just felt back uh, anyway. And so that going towards something and saying, you know, not just like what did the Buddha say about this or that, or, you know, I wrote a, a paper on that or I did a midterm on that, but, you know, what might those techniques do for me it was not actually selfish. It was, it was so essential, and that's what I was calling faith. Um, and uh, in the Buddhist teaching, faith is a process, and so um, the first stage is, is often called bright faith, and that's likened to falling in love, where uh, we have the feeling like maybe we're sitting in a dark and closed room, the door's shut, and then somehow the door swings open, and we go, whoa, it's a bigger world than I had imagined. And, Maybe we've met a teacher or we read something or we come upon a community or we do it through art or 
you know, music or even tremendous suffering. There's so many ways in which that door can <coughs> swing open. Um, and it's a tremendous feeling. It's like the launch, and we really need that. But it's also considered kind of unstable and, and uh, needs maturing. I mean, for one thing, it can be really fickle. If it comes from meeting a teacher, you might meet a teacher one day and say, yeah, you know, that's the way it's, I'm going to lead my life. And then you meet another teacher another day, and you think, well, forget that other guy. You know, this is the one. Because it's not grounded in yourself, you know, in your own sense of what's true. And the other really dangerous thing about that kind of faith is that it's such an extraordinary feeling. It's so intoxicating that we don't want to do anything that might challenge our proximity of what seems to be the source of that incredible feeling, which is external to ourselves. So that's where people get afraid to ask questions and to doubt and to say, well, you know, that makes me kind of uncomfortable. How does that fit with that? And so that that's gets to be like a degeneration of faith. And then the next stage of faith is called verified faith, uh, which interestingly enough, we go from bright faith to verified faith by questioning, by wondering, by doubting, by insisting on seeing the truth for ourselves. And, and we, um, we really uh, know that as beautiful as an external source can be, ultimately it has to be from within, uh, that we, we have a sense of connection and, and clarity and wisdom. And then it goes on from there to what's called abiding faith or um, unwavering faith, which doesn't mean unwavering holding of a belief. I think it means that you've seen so deeply what you feel to be true that you in a way become it. And here the Dalai Lama is my great uh, example. When he was first awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, somebody, one of my friends said, Giving the Dalai Lama a peace prize is like giving Mother Nature an art award. <laughs> you know? But it didn't just happen. I mean, he's the one who sits like three hours a day or four hours a day. It's not haphazard, but it's so in him. It's so him that you don't ever get the feeling of artifice or pretense like, oh, you're really boring, but I am the Dalai Lama. You know, I better <laughs> act like you're interesting. You know, it's not like that. So uh, I think that is the evolution of faith. And I think I, as we all are, I'm in different places with lots of different things. Um, I, you know, I don't think of myself as a Buddhist, for example, but I am. And I just don't think that way most of the time, but in some contexts I do. Um, if I was doing the census, I'd say Buddhist. Uh, you know, but it, it's not the way I hold it. And uh, I have a real sense of certainty around things like the Buddha saying, hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. From within, not because I've memorized it, you know, and I feel obliged to say it, but I feel that's verified in my being. Uh, from my own experience. And so it's kind of different places and different aspects of life. One more question. Yes, ma'am. I don't think we're saying different things. I think we're talking about two different things. Uh, so she challenged the notion when I had made a comment that in regard to caregivers, that oftentimes they don't have boundaries and the result they get depleted in terms of their energy or personal resources to continue doing their job. She challenged that, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, that in fact we have boundless or unlimited energy and there should be no boundaries about giving love or concern to others. Is that a correct statement? But I think there are two different things uh, because when you are to the point, when you are, have that mindset internalized, you are absolutely correct. 
but getting to the point where you have, if you will, unlimited love, unlimited generosity is a transformation of spirit that for many, it takes an immense amount of time and effort and sometimes just doing the job they have today in the real world is overwhelming and they don't have the resources to deal with that, much less give so much to others. So I think they're slightly different things and that's why I think when Sharon was talking about the Dalai Lama and his practice, if you are around those type of people, another person who reminds me of that is Amma. Do you know Amma? Yeah, Amma. Here she'll sit and hug people for 12, 18, 24 hours and have this boundless, unlimited energy and she never runs out. And those qualities are hard for the average person to manifest, I think. And uh, uh, I mean, how many people here have absolutely unboundless, limitless, I, I think it's probably two people. Uh, oh, I see one there. there uh, <laughs> okay, Ferdos back there, did you have another question? Oh, you're her surrogate hand raiser. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, the question was, uh, the second question was basically around discernment in terms of what I was talking about, motivation and then skillfulness of action because we live in complex systems. You know, everybody involved has a kind of motivation and, and how can you tell and, um, I think it is complex, but it's really not about, uh, if I understand you correctly, it's not about trying to interpret someone else's motivation, which wouldn't be very wise, uh, but getting in touch with your own. Because the more we can connect to that, uh, the more we understand what we really want out of an interaction, maybe what we want more than anything. Um, and it, I think it reveals a lot for us. And it also points to, you know, I, and one example would be if you're talking to somebody and you're about to disclose a really nasty piece of gossip about someone else, and it happens to be true, but it's really nasty, and you feel that motivation come up, which is a little bit like, I know something you don't know, I'm powerful. And you realize that, you recognize it for what it is, and you think, maybe not, right? Because what would it serve this person to become so disillusioned about this other person? And why would I want to be the vehicle for bringing that other person down? It's just, I don't need that. You know, that kind of motivation uh, is, is not gonna produce much happiness for me in the end. So it's, it's very revealing to see where we're coming from. But now my main point about that was, was really for us to make a distinction between the two. So between the motivation and the execution of the action, because we don't want to fall into that trap of thinking that compassion is always nice and sweet and the action will always be to acquiesce or to say yes, because maybe it's not going to be that. Your best judgment, your best discernment in a particular situation is that you've got to say no. You've got to not give them money or whatever it might be. Um, and you don't need to uh, discount your own compassion because that may, may be very vibrant and vital right in that same moment. So uh, maybe I'll just finish with saying uh, there's a third part of the action in that model that I didn't talk about, which I think is what you're talking about, which is uh, talked about as the immediate response. Um, the first part of that that's interesting is the immediacy because, for example, um, maybe you are doing something really out of the goodness of your heart and you do it as skillfully as you possibly can and it doesn't bring immediate results. This person doesn't say, thank you so much for that book. It's like the best thing I've ever seen, uh, which you really want them to say. Um, but sometimes a long time later, 
those people come back and they say, you know, you gave me that book and it really didn't mean anything to me, I have to say, as though I couldn't tell. And, and they say, but now, you know, I lost my job or my mother got sick or I have this incredible opportunity that's opens up in front of me and I feel kind of timid and I open the book and it's perfect. You know, so, so many times we are just in the position of planting a seed. That's part of it. And then there is the great dynamic of praise and blame. You know, you can't say to that person that you're about to give this book to, uh, I want you to come into the room at 10.30 because something's going to happen. And before you come in, don't check your email. Don't check your cell phone messages. Don't have a conversation with anybody. Don't have a single thought in your head because I want you to arrive as a completely blank slate. That doesn't happen either, right? So that's why when we talk about integrity or assessing our action, of course we care how someone responds and we want to be thanked and we want all that praise, but we can't count on it. And so we look back at our motivation and we look back at the skillfulness of the action and, and as best as possible, have a kind of balance with the reality of life that you don't always get told it's the best book I've ever read. Just it's to bad. make another couple comments, you know, we have a perception of free will, but all of our actions are manifestation of events that are happening around us. Uh, there was an interesting study that was done where they took two groups of people who are advertising executives and the person who was doing this said, I'm gonna give you a marketing campaign that I wanna do and I want you to independently come up with ideas and show them to me, but I will guarantee you that I will show you exactly what you're gonna to show to me. And so it basically takes them from the airport as they drive to the city to get to the office. And in fact, the task is done and in fact, both of them come up with identical advertising campaigns and they just cannot believe it because they've been isolated in these two different rooms and there's been no conversation. But what happened was, is that there were cues that were given to them all along the path from the airport to the office and they did not have an appreciation of the impact of all of these events. And my point to you is, it takes discernment and self-awareness to understand that a lot of the actions that we engage in are actually occurring not because we even want them to happen, but we're reacting unconsciously to events. And if you at least have that perception, it tempers how you respond. And I think the other aspect of it is when we do actions, oftentimes we have an attachment to the outcome of those actions. And that's why, you know, you're doing something and you're hoping the person says, thank you so much for that book, it changed my life. And they look at you and go, why the hell are you giving this to me? Uh, and you're like, damn you, I was trying to help you and you don't even appreciate it. Versus saying, I give this to you because I think it will help you. And there's nothing more to it than that. And I think that's one of the hardest things to learn uh, as well. Well, listen, you guys actually did my job because you guys asked the questions. Uh, uh, it was really wonderful, Sharon. Thank, thank you so you. much. It was a blessing to have thank you. you. Thank you.